look back in history as like, hey, that's one thing that really changed Bitcoin. And the reason is actually pretty, pretty simple, right? Like it's the first use case on Bitcoin L1 that has actually captured attention from the right on. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Empire. We are uh, really lucky to be joined today by Munib Ali, who, Munib, I think you were the first guest ever on Empire. So it is a long time coming. Uh, nice little reunion. Yeah, I think I think I remember I was the first guest and your podcast has come a long way since then. So congrats on all the success. Thanks for me. It's really come a long way since I joined Empire. So uh, <laughs> yeah. I appreciate it. The the days. <laughs> I really appreciate it. I already like you already. I promise I won't I ask all the hard questions. <laughs> yeah, Munib's like, the show's really improved. <laughs> Don't know what happened. <laughs> so Munib, usually we don't do this, but actually I thought it'd be helpful. A lot of our audience is may maybe a little more deep into the ETH game. So I'm going to give a little background on what you guys have been building. And I'd love for you to just like, I think it just as a helpful primer and then correct me if I'm wrong, obviously. And then we can jump into all things ordinals, on-chain activity on Bitcoin and stuff. But my understanding is that uh, Stacks, so there's like, you have um, a, a couple different like entities, I'd call it, or like uh, open source projects that you're working on. Stacks, my understanding is an open source project started by a bunch of Bitcoin builders. And the devs behind Stacks have been working on Bitcoin for a really long time. In 2017, I remember you guys raised from uh, Union Square Ventures, the, the the block size wars were going on, and it had become super clear to people that the only way to scale transactions or like new use cases on Bitcoin was through layer twos. And actually before all these L2 talks about Coinbase's L2 and Arbitrum and Optimism, um, it was really Stacks and Lightning, which were like L2s on Bitcoin. And so Stacks, the way that I think about it, is just uh, is just a Bitcoin L2. And the Lightning Network is like, if people know Lightning, it's like an L2 on Bitcoin, but peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Uh, Stacks is more like smart contracts on Bitcoin. And um, I think your guys' vision for a while now has been like, whatever you can build on Ethereum or Solana or another smart contracting layer, you can build on Stacks. Is that... How did I do there? No, I think I think I think you, you did a great job. But one thing I want to point out is that um, L2s, especially in Ethereum, have a very precise definition. And according to that definition, Stacks is actually not an L2. But without getting into the technical detail, I think high level most people think of, think of it as an L2. So I'm not surprised that uh, you are as well. But it, generally speaking, I think spot on. Uh, it's a bunch of Bitcoin builders, like you know, who work including me, like we're working on literally the L1, like Bitcoin L1, Bitcoin scripting language, tried building interesting things with it. And as you can imagine, it's fairly limited, both in, in terms of what you could program, but also in terms of scalability. And yep. 2017 is when, you know, Lightning started, the Stacks layer started. And uh, just, I would say last year is when we're seeing this like revival of Bitcoin builders culture, which I'm I'm just like so, so excited. I think that yeah. Cardinals actually play, play a big role in it. Can you give us context and background as to why this res like emergence resurgence of developer activity? Because it felt for a while like there was like the obvious question for this episode is why is this why is this time any different? Because it's been chat about like you know Bitcoin doing this precisely over over the years, but it hasn't really amounted to much. Yeah, I think I think some background context is maybe helpful here, right? So uh, what I observed in the Bitcoin community, I would say between twenty thirteen and until the block size war started in 2017, is that there was always like this healthy community of developers who are intellectually curious, want to do interesting things. And a bunch of experiments would happen on Bitcoin. Like counterparties are a great example. NFCs started literally on, on Bitcoin and one. Same with uh, colored coins, which are like early ICOs. People actually like raised ICO money on Bitcoin L1 using, using colored coins. Uh, we, I built a uh, decentralized domain system so in terms of like, you know, being uh, pre something, so it predates ENS. Uh, it was a Bitcoin L1 in 2015. Still still runs, actually. Uh, I, I own those names, which are probably like historic uh, at some point, and people are going to rediscover them. Uh, and and I think that that culture really drastically changed. Obviously, obviously I'm simplifying the story a little bit uh, during the block size wars. Two things were happening. One, Ethereum started taking off. Like I think it had its like CryptoKitties moment. A lot of the intellectually curious people, people who wanted to, you know, play around with things. Uh, frankly, Ethereum was the better, easier way to do it. Right? Like you, you have a full execution environment, but more importantly, the culture is very, very welcoming. 
whatever experiment you want to run, you can come in and you can do that. On the Bitcoin side, when the when the civil war was happening, the people who ended up winning the war, and I, I was actually on the smaller block side during during that time, they were sort of like one of their arguments was we don't need any of these use cases. So why would you ever want to increase the block size? Bitcoin should just be money. And I think if that is your winning party, it actually sends a message to the rest of the community because I do think the culture changed a lot. Like the, the the folks who gained like more voice share and became more powerful, influential. And I think that's like really uh, what maybe you guys, uh, if you're more active in eat, you've interacted more with, you know, what we call the Bitcoin maximalists. And they're sort of like sitting on the sidelines, uh, cheering for every experiment that fails, uh, not understanding that this is how Silicon Valley works. Like a few things do well and they do really, really well. And the long tail of startups basically fails. So if you are cheering like every failed experiment, you're actually not innovating. You're not not sort of like doing anything. I think we went through like those years um, after the block size wars, and and people had options. Like, you know, frankly, if you get yelled at as a developer in one ecosystem and you're welcome and embraced in another, it's a pretty obvious choice where where you would want to go. Uh, and a small group of people, including myself, a, a bunch of others, who are really interested in Bitcoin, the tool. Those are separate camps, right? People who are interested in Bitcoin, the technology, the tool they want to build, they want to actually use it, and Bitcoin, the idea or the religion. And I think we've heard a lot more from the religious crowd and not as much from the builder crowd. And I think that that is sort of like changing now, and I can I can kind of get into why. Yeah. Okay. So that that makes a lot of sense to me, Munib. I think one question that I would have is why, right? Why not just separate Bitcoin and ETH? Bitcoin has product market fit. It is digital gold. Why not just build apps on Ethereum where like we have this great smart contracting layer already? Why to, why, why, why are you trying to almost like force this smart contracting layer onto Bitcoin? It, it feels like a little bit. Yeah, so I think, I think it's a great question. Um, so I would just look at the market reality that even after the last uh, cycle of the, the bull market, uh, we still have like $500 billion of BTC capital mostly just sitting there. Right, ETH is like I don't know, 200, 250 billion or something, and I think that's sort of like a like a blue ocean opportunity where there's so much capital, it's very much like sort of like sitting passively, and if you're a developer, you can almost like come in and try to make it productive. I, I do think like people are trying to build bridges to other ecosystems. So we have uh, you know WBDC going going to Ethereum. There's some bridge going going to Avalanche, but if you're focused on bringing the functionality to Bitcoin, that's sort of like the opposite of that, right? Like instead of trying to take BTC to a chain that has contracts, you're doing the reverse of it. You're saying, I'm going to bring all of the functionality where the capital is sort of like already sitting. Mm. Yeah, it, it feels like such an obvious thing. It, it may be one of these things where like in five years time, if this actually works, we'll be like, to what you just said. But I'm curious, like if you could go into the tech of like, how hard is it to actually build like programming, like smart contracting language, like L2s in Ethereum have been discussed since the inception of Ethereum, scalability was on the roadmap. And there's a number of teams that have been, you know, focused on this Arbitrum, for instance, since the early days of Ethereum was working on this at Princeton, which I believe you also went to. Uh, I may be wrong here, but anyways, I'm, I'm really curious if you could go into the tech and the, where kind of you guys are. And like, what's a roadmap look like? Um, yeah, but I think that, that's a great question. Uh, yeah, I, I did my PhD at Benson. I know I have Felton uh, from there and it's all the early team. And I would say that uh, you need, really need to understand, you need to spend time in the Bitcoin ecosystem and that understand the challenges. And I typically categorize them into a handful of things. Uh, one thing is that uh, Bitcoin is lagging in terms of, developer tools and basic infrastructure. Like I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Like because of the Ar Ardenal's uh, interest, people were actually trying to find wallets that were compatible with Taproot. And they, they, they couldn't find a wallet. They couldn't, you know, find basic like dev tooling libraries that they could use to actually even make their wallets compatible with Taproot. Like simple basic stuff that's just not there. And then that's why having a builder's community actually helps because right now, like within weeks, some of the top wallets that actually integrated Ardenals or Taproot or make it easy for people to do th these things on Bitcoin L1 are actually builders from the Stacks layer ecosystem. 
like the Xverse wallet or Hero wallet and, and so on. So one thing is like people people don't realize how bad the dev tooling and infrastructure situation in Bitcoin is. So theoretically, all these things are possible. Practically, you actually need to raise a bunch of capital, which is harder in the in the in the Bitcoin space, right? Like because investors have sort of like, uh, or at least before the recent uh, interest, they're thinking of Bitcoin as like a digital goal. They're not thinking of that as a kind of app platform or something that where people are coming in and building. And the, the last thing is the culture, right? And like if your if your if your culture is sort of like rejecting builders instead of embracing it, I think it, it, it becomes a becomes a hard thing. So those those are high level things at the deeper technical level. I do think the Bitcoin being very, very simple. So if you look at, you know, uh let's say the scalability limitations of Bitcoin, it's the flip side of Bitcoin being more decentralized. So on one side, that's a benefit that, hey, it's very decentralized. You could run it on a Raspberry Pi. Can't say the same thing for a Solana node or, or something else, right? But then it's very hard to scale. And it's the flip side of the same thing. And and then you could say Bitcoin is very simple and it's very durable. But the flip side is that you can't program it much because it's so limited at the base there. So in terms of L2s specifically, uh, you know, you need certain support from Bitcoin L1 to be able to build the type of rollups and fraud proofs like Arbitrum on, on Bitcoin. And that and Bitcoin, historically, it's not easy to change it. So I can't be uh, a team that raised a bunch of capital and said, oh, I'm going to propose like these changes to Bitcoin and I know in the next six months or a year, they're going to get rolled up. Now, not going to happen. <laughs> but it's going to take a very, very long time. So what people are doing and what literally the Stacks project did is that we had a design principle that you could never ask for a change uh, from the L1. So do the best you can, like as a layer, and then maybe in some years, if you need some support from L1, uh, it, it might happen. So I, I think like because of those reasons, it, this is why like in some way there's a market opportunity, especially for developers. You you have almost like uh, a situation where there's ton of passive Bitcoin capital, actually less competition. Not a lot of people are trying to build there. At least it's changing now, but but still, like, I think relatively much less competition. But then there are the challenges that are you willing to work with, you know, pretty bad dev tooling, improve it? Are you willing to get yelled at like on Twitter? And, you know, these are, you can, you, you, you can see like, you know, what the, what the trade-offs are. Yeah. Munib, I want to get into ordinal, uh, ordinals. So for people who haven't been following ordinals of the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem this, this year, this really interesting thing happened uh, in Bitcoin, which is uh, the creator of uh there's a person who kind of found this unintended feature from uh, the Bitcoin Taproot upgrade, uh, and and they launched an NFT collection that essentially stored data and 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 NFTs in Satoshi's. And I think we've had, I think we're like 200,000 now this year already, or somewhere around 200,000 uh, ordinals. And I think we were kind of paying attention to it, saying like this is pretty interesting. Like it felt like this was one of the more interesting things to happen in Bitcoin recently. The Bitcoin kind of maxi crowd, I would say, was like pretty upset about this, saying look, the Bitcoin blockchain should not be used for this stuff. Then there's this whole other cohort of people who are saying, no, 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 this is amazing. Like people are building on Bitcoin for the first time. And it sparked like, I just got a pitch for an, a Bitcoin NFT marketplace, which looked pretty cool. And there was actually this Chris Berniski tweet who I, I really respect uh, Chris's thoughts. He said, we'll look back at ordinals as a moment that changed Bitcoin forever. And I'd like to get your maybe holistic view on on ordinals and and how you're feeling about that that right now. Yeah, I, I I agree with Chris. I think it's one of those things where um, we would look back in history as like, hey, that's one thing that really changed Bitcoin. And the reason is actually pretty pretty simple, right? Like it's the first use case on Bitcoin L1 that has actually captured attention from the right audience. Like I'm not saying it, it has gone mainstream at all. It's still very, very early, but it's getting the attention from all the right parties. Like the builders are paying attention. There's a little bit of a gold rush happening where startups are competing over shipping features for Ordinals. Uh, new artists are coming in. Like I think Yuga Labs just announced like two days ago that they, they'll be doing it. And people sort of like get why Bitcoin NFTs, especially on L1, where the image is literally in the Bitcoin chain is, is valuable. Right? Like they, they can see that if this thing cannot be destroyed, as long as BTC has any value. So the same reason why my Bitcoin is valuable, uh, this NFT is also valuable because it's literally on, on the L1 chain. And I think that's clicking with people. So the the spark sort of happened, and the rest of the 
uh, ecosystem building uh, activities that happen that you know builders rush in, capital starts chasing that, you can see it happen. And when it's happening, everyone's like, wait a minute, if this really happens, there is a ton of BTC capital. There is a ton of like potential uh, activity that can happen. And I, I think people are kind of like seeing uh, what that could be because before, I think as uh, Santi was probably saying earlier, that people have heard this story so many times, like, oh, Bitcoin DeFi is coming or X is happening, Y is happening. And when you dig deeper, I think a lot of them were false promises. Like for example, even even this uh, even this upgrade Taproot. Like Bitcoin has basically had two major upgrades since the the Civil War in 2017. One was SegWit. Uh, SegWit effectively just compresses your transactions a, a little bit and you pay less fees because your transactions are now smaller. And Taproot is a similar thing, right? Like it 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 gives you a little bit more compression and it gives you some privacy benefits because a bunch of the data is not not on chain until you reveal it. So you can write slightly more advanced scripts. And it was marketed by the, by the Bitcoin maximalist community as smart contracts are coming to Bitcoin. You know, Bitcoin DeFi is coming. Every other chain is going to die. That, that is not even close to the reality because it's not even a fully, fully execution environment. It's not an EVM. It's not like uh, what developers are used to. It is a slightly more advanced, pretty limited script. And Taproot launched and for a year, basically nothing happened, right? Like the utilization, if you look at the charts, it was like less than 1% utilization on the Bitcoin network and the Bitcoin network itself doesn't get a lot of utilization. Blocks were, you know, empty like a, a lot of times. And then Ordinals happened. And I think Ordinals is very interesting in a couple of dimensions. The, the first one is it actually hits a valid criticism that Bitcoin gets that how are you going to pay for your security budget 10 years later? It's not a problem in the next 10 years, but it can be a problem after 10 to 15 years. And Ordinals is saying, look, Bitcoin is the should be the most valued block space on the planet. And and we've already seen like a 10x uh, increase in, in fees at a pretty sustainable level. And I think fees might do another 10x or 100x from here. So you have a clear, clear sort of like story for now people value Bitcoin's block space. That's one. The second thing is, uh, that it has actually changed the culture a little bit because a lot of people were sort of like, you know, they, they got introduced to crypto maybe through Bitcoin, but are now spending time in Ethereum or Solana somewhere else. They're coming back and saying, I've been in so many uh, Twitter business chats where people are like, oh, I had nothing to do with my Bitcoin for the last four years. Now, for the first time, I, I can actually do something. I can I can try to do a mint, I can participate, I can try to do a trade or something. And people are excited. It's al almost like a, a coming home and if you go to those uh, spaces or those conversations, they're actually drawing much bigger audiences than the Bitcoin maximalist crowds. I think that's a very important shift because now a lot of the builders, like they wouldn't even get invited to speak at a, at a Bitcoin part and like a Bitcoin maximalist podcast or a Twitter space. And the conversations were about the same old, like, hey, Bitcoin only has a 21 million supply, never going to change. How many times can you talk about that? Right? Like there's, there's actually like fresh content uh, real energy from builders and they're, they're now getting airtime and they're sort of like it's like a fork in the community right they're, it's a different community and and i think that's very very healthy uh for for bitcoin culture and the last thing is like actual builders raising capital uh running like true startups right not like a a lot of projects in bitcoin are if you dig deeper it's like one or two people who have an open source project on the side and their ideas and they've been talking about it for five years right like versus a startup can do insane amount of damage like within four weeks of actual hacking. And I think you're seeing more of those type of people come in. And a lot are actually coming coming from the Stacks Learn ecosystem because I think for one reason or the other, that ecosystem attracted real capital from sophisticated investors and real builders like who, who know what they're doing. I think now it's sort of like their time to shine, even even on the Bitcoin L1 side. So from a deployment standpoint, like, do you anticipate these this being as contentious as some of the other crises that sort of like contentious moments that the Bitcoin network has had in, you know, getting people on board on certain upgrades? Yeah. So I think I think that's the interesting part. Taproot had already gone live, right? So when people were 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 sort of like saying, "Hey, this is spam. It shouldn't happen," uh, the reply was like, "It's a valid Bitcoin transaction." totally accepted by Bitcoin rules, your node now has a, 
picture of my monkey, right? And it will be stored there. And you, there's nothing you can do about it, right? So in some ways, and then people were like, maybe miners would try to censor that. And then the miner, miners came out and they're like, we're actually making more money. Like, we actually love ordinals because we make more revenue. Our blocks were not full. Now, for the first time, our blocks are sort of like running at capacity. So very quickly, it became like a thing where people very people sort of like realize that the maximus crowd that is loud on Twitter and on podcasts, they actually don't control the network, right? Like the Bitcoin network is open and anyone can do what they want, want with it. And I think that's a really interesting uh, realization. The big difference was that otherwise, the proposals that got shot down uh, are typically proposals to change Bitcoin. This is just using Bitcoin as it is today, and you can just like run with it. Right? Like it's, you, you don't need you don't need any permission. Hmm. Do you th so, Munib, do you think there's any validity to folks who are saying like we should censor these transactions because this is not the right way to use the Bitcoin blockchain? I think there there are some concerns. Uh, so I'll I'll bring the top two ones. One is that people are saying that look some sort of like you know well-off people um in a developed country are storing you know monkey pictures while in developing regions where people really need access to hard money they won't be able to pay the fees and the answer to that is they would never be able to pay the fees on bitcoin l1 uh because they should be doing those transactions on the lightning network right and the lightning network settlements should always be important big and important enough that you can pay the fee to settle the thing on uh on the l1 so the, so it, Lightning is totally like uh, separate from that. The only impact on Lightning is that maybe your settlements now are a little bit more expensive, but they were always assumed to be expensive because you're doing like thousands and thousands of, of transactions and settling them in one, one sort of like a channel. Course. So that's that's one argument that I think it sort of like appeals to people. Uh, oh, maybe you know uh, we should leave the block space open for these use cases, and the answer is no. There is the Lightning Network, which is cheap, but everyone should sort of like use that. And the second thing is when people start uh, talking about illegal content, what if, what if somebody puts an image off on my node that is illegal in my jurisdiction? And there's a very simple answer. Uh, the way these things are inscribed, you could actually prune your node, which is like you can actually clean, clean things out. You can say that, hey, my intention for running the Bitcoin node is because I want to run a full node. And you can, you can just prune out that data uh, to be to be compliant in the in the jurisdiction that that you're living in. Mm. Do you think it's safe to say that ordinals? Uh, I know I know you're going to disagree with this. I was going to say that ordinals saved Bitcoin in the sense that, and 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 I know you're going to say no, but there's money, there's money Bitcoin, there's sound money and uh, sound money Bitcoin, and then there's like innovation Bitcoin. And when I hear you say this, like I think sound money Bitcoin is like going just as planned. Actually, I think it's going great. But innovation Bitcoin was like really dying. But with with uh, ordinals, it's kind of renewed Bitcoin as this chain for like innovation and new use cases and just like enthusiasm around Bitcoin builders. So I'm, I'd be curious to get your take yeah. on that. I, I'll, I'll tweak that a little bit. Right. So yeah. my tweak is that there is the money Bitcoin and the builders actually believe in that. Right. So I one of the biggest reasons I've been attracted to Bitcoin is I really like the fact that it's simple at the base layer and the money guarantees. So I'm part of money Bitcoin. I think the camps are a little bit different. They both are believers in like money Bitcoin, but one camp is the Bitcoin, the tool, like people who actually like use it, like literally just even use it uh, and treat it as a technology and an open source project or, or try to do interesting things with it. Call it the Bitcoin builders camp. And the other camp is people who like the idea of Bitcoin. It's almost like a religious thing, right? They don't even care about the tool. Like they don't even want to use it. Like they 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 like to talk about it. And I think there's a huge difference between the two. One community is actually not that technical. There are a handful of people who are more technical in the community. Most people like don't understand things that are technical things at a deeper level. And and the other community, the Bitcoin as a tool community, those people are not as as uh, radical uh, as uh, as the other one. And I do think that over time, in the last three four years. The, the Maximus community at least started dominating Twitter and podcasts and conferences and and, and, and the narratives. And what does Ordinals has done is that it has sort of like switched the attention, the spotlight from one community to the other, which I think is a very, very healthy, healthy thing uh, for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Obviously, DeFi was a killer use case for Ethereum. For so long, it was just an ICO kind of, kind of raising machine. 
in some capacity Bitcoin served that as well. But DeFi really like launched a whole wave of innovation and probably to this day transfers of value are, you know, the killer use case of Ethereum. And so I'm curious how you envision the DeFi landscape opening up in, in Bitcoin with stacks as an L2. I believe there's like over 250 million locked in the staking contract. There was some yield opportunity. I mean, your tweet sort of referenced over 2,200 BTC have gone out in rewards. Curious to understand how that comes from, like where the yield comes from, where the rewards are coming from, and more broadly, kind of how the DeFi ecosystem evolves and shapes up in, in the Bitcoin. Yeah. So I think, uh, Sax, I think you mentioned at the at the beginning that it's a very decentralized ecosystem. Uh, we that the project did a uh, SEC qualified offering back in 2019, and the flip side of that is that because you've done such a compliant offering, you have to be very serious about decentralization as well. So before the mainnet launch, it's a little bit like the original company behind it was dismantled in a way, even though it on paper it exists, but uh, the original team just went off and did did different things. 30 plus entities in the ecosystem. And uh, the current version of Stacks, I would say, if you, if you try using it, basically has two very big limitations right now. One is around speed. It runs at Bitcoin speed. So you can imagine if you're a Ethereum user or Avalon, Solana, uh, if you have to wait 10 minutes or 30 minutes for a transaction, like you will be blowing your hair. Like you'll be like, yeah, hey, what, what is this? And it's a, it's a security thing because Stacks actually benefits from the security of Bitcoin. But the next upgrade, uh, you will be able to do much faster transaction in the, in the order of seconds. And so many, many blocks between two Bitcoin blocks. So that's one thing. I think it's a big limitation uh, for existing developers and, and users of Stacks. And the second, even bigger limitation, like by far uh, the biggest one, is that the decentralized way of moving your BTC from the L1 into the Stacks layer and back is not, not lively. Right? So the different sort of like ways that exist right now. Uh, if you look at Liquid, which is a federation, if you look at RSK, uh, they sort of do something else, merge mining, but they're, the way they move BTC is a federation. So in this day and age, I don't think you can expect people to trust like random entities that, hey, we are running a federation, give me your BTC and we will decide. Like Maxi thinking in <laughs> generation. Yeah, that's like- I mean, Exactly, <laughs> right? So, so, so those are federations uh, at, at, at Stacks, a lot of like, um, you know, focus is on how do we enable a decentralized pack? And that's where some of the criticism for the L2 definition comes in, that if Bitcoin had opcodes at the L1 level, it might in the future, where you could just force the withdrawal of your BTC out of stacks from the L1. I think that's the level of security that rollups or, you know, fraud proofs like Arbitrum have. The next best thing you could do is that there's a decentralized group of signers a little bit like people who validate Ethereum blocks and they have capital lock, right? And they need to sign on the BDC panel. Uh, and so that's the design that is, the system is called SBDC. And obviously I'm biased, I'm, I'm contributing to SBDC. Uh, and, and I think SBDC could be the spark for actual Bitcoin DeFi, not the type of claims you've seen before, uh, like how Ordinals is to NFTs. Because I think it will be a real, uh, actual decentralized system where people can just you know move their capital uh, into a layer which is fully programmable and then bring it back in a, in a decentralized way. And I think I think uh, one other thing I want to quickly touch upon is that then people ask like, hey, then how is Stacks secured by Bitcoin? So the way it's secured is that, especially with the, after the next upgrade, the, the security to reorg the chain, like if you, you know, let's say I did a transaction uh, and someone wants to reorg it, say it never happened, that is secured uh, after the next upgrade by 100% of Bitcoin's hash power. So if someone wants to basically come and reorder transactions, do a deep reorg, basically tries to mess with the chain, they'll have to go and reorg Bitcoin, which I think is a great security property uh, that you're sort of like, better, you're not benefiting from just the $500 billion of capital sitting there, but unlocking it, you're also benefiting by all the security of the, the L1. And, and, and then uh, as I said, like there could be opcodes introduced, uh, actually just one, uh, that can enable the decentralized way of taking, uh, not decentralized, it's just the L1 way of taking your BDC out of Stacks here. Hey everyone, quick break from Empire to tell you about another Blockworks channel that I know you're gonna love. I've been in crypto full-time for five years and have always struggled with one thing, which is keeping up with the next big trend. As soon as I wrap my head around MEV, 
we're on to app chains. As soon as I wrap my head around app chains, we're on to liquid staking derivatives. I'm sure you've been there. Blockworks Research has solved that problem for me. Our team puts research, data, governance, proposal updates, models, and more into one really easy to use platform so I can always stay ahead of the curve. If I don't understand something, for example, I just pull up the platform, I can search for an L1, I can search for a protocol, pull up the platform at blockworksresearch.com, I search the term, there's always an amazing amount of insight in a really consumable way. Uh, right now you can subscribe to the platform, it's 2,500 bucks a year or 900 bucks a quarter. Hopefully you can uh, make more than $208 a month by using the platform. If you can't, you're probably in the wrong business. But if you're not ready to subscribe to the platform today, you can subscribe to the research team's free newsletter. Uh, you can follow their Twitter handles today. Links in the show notes. Trust me, once you do that, you're gonna wanna subscribe to the platform. If you are ready to, uh, to subscribe right now, I got you guys with a little hookup. Empire listeners get a 10% discount for the first 50 people who use the code Empire10. Got your back. Check out the links in the, sh in the description to find out more. Now, let's get back to the show. Mm -hmm. So just, uh, I, know, I know we're kind of bumping up until we have like 10 minutes and, and unfortunately we can't go into that much detail of SPTC, but from a, from a like technical standpoint, like what are some of the key things that need to be resolved that haven't been resolved yet? Like in, in the next six to 12 months, like what are the things that you're focused on to make this a reality? Cause it sounds like it's still kind of very much work in progress. Yeah. So I think my, my company, so, um, uh, after the decentralization of the, of, of the ecosystem, I actually raised capital into a new company, Trust Machines. Last year, we raised $150 million round, and we are actually looking to build applications. We are looking to build DeFi and, and other types of applications uh, on Bitcoin. And obviously it's going to happen through Bitcoin layers. And, and we also discovered that the SBTC work is very critical. So we don't contribute that much to other stacks infrastructure as a company, but we have a business interest in making SBTC happen because it's literally required. You can't launch a DeFi application without having SBTC live. Mm -hmm. So uh, there has been a ton of progress, right? So the technical designs are basically done. Um, the technical papers came out in December and it's like a working group that, that, that worked on it. We, we participated in that. And now some of the early code is even on, you know, like it's, 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 it's public now. So I think there is there's enough progress happening. Uh, I don't think it will launch in H1 of 2023 this year, but I do think it can launch in the in the second half of this year, which, which again, it, it, these are open source systems and we'll see how what happens. That's my read of just looking at the, at the progress rate. Mm -hmm. Well, I was just going to ask, like, well, what's it contingent on? Like, obviously there's a thorough review process and, and test nets and, you know, there's a methodical way of doing this, but anything else that? Yeah, you know, I think the more, I would say most of the technical things are behind us, right? So there is a clear, the technical stuff has been translated into actual engineering requirements of like, hey, this is the code, people are writing the code. It's the typical things of like, whenever there's a big consensus level of grid, a bunch of testing needs to happen. We, we, the, the devs do expect like hundreds of millions or maybe billions of dollars of capital being kept on that code. So I think the security audits and the, and the level of scrutiny there is going to be pretty high. Uh, but but this team has also done this in the past, right? Like they, there have been consensus level upgrades of the stacks there before. So one one interesting thing about SBDC, it's an asset that's secured literally by the consensus at the consensus level of stacks. So stacks is sort of saying a big big change that might happen is I think the unit of economy uh, on the apps running on stacks will actually become BDC, which would be sort of like welcomed by a lot of the Bitcoin community as well. Because what people, you're really unlocking BDC capital. Um, mm -hmm. Stacks is sort of the thing you use to lock up your capital and become like a signer. It's incentives really for miners and signers. Uh, but 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 the thing people are going to use is the, is likely going to be SBDC. In some capacity, this reminds me a little bit of um, Keep. I don't know if you remember this, or you remember the project, Madden, the team there. He came, I think, from a Bitcoin background from an architectural standpoint what you just said reminds me a little bit of that this like signers of is it fair comparison or not i, I think i think it's fair it's a, there's there are differences but I, I can actually give you an example like this would never happen in ethereum but imagine what what's happening here is sort of like if you took cheap like the work that they have done you integrated it into ethereum's consensus 
So it's secured at Ethereum's consensus level. And you and you said, instead of, instead of Ethereum, we're going to start using Bitcoin as our unit of economy. And Bitcoin is the asset that we are trying to secure. So, so people are still locking up ETH in consensus and, 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 and they were earning, somehow they were earning BTC rewards, right? So this is how Stacks works. The, the rewards that people are getting is in, they're on BTC, right? Uh, uh, by four parties spending consensus. It's a, it's a massive change. Like Ethereum would never do this, but imagine that just, Ethereum- just why that, not? That, like posit, well, why not? I, I think like there is such a large community now who believe in ETH as money. So it, it, that's really what, what it's about that on the stack layer side, we believe in Bitcoin. Right? So at the at the core consensus level, we feel comfortable making SBTC a first class asset and just even designing the consensus algorithm to optimize for the security of the BD, SBTC transfers. In, in the Ethereum world, Keep is like one out of many projects just working at the application layer. They're not gonna get support like from core each consensus. Munib, I know we have to wrap this in a second. Um, what is some, you are probably the deepest person in the space in terms of like building on Bitcoin. What is something that feels like abundantly obvious to you about what Bitcoin is going to look like 12 months from you, uh, now that is like probably not obvious to most people right now? Yeah, I, I think it's basically, um, I, I, I try to tell people to visualize this, that right now when you go to MetaMask or some other wallet, um, People are like, hey, I have ETH and I can swap it to a stable coin. I can buy an NFT. I can lock my ETH, start uh, earning a yield on it. It's like pretty natural. Bitcoin right now is, you know, there are these clunky wallets and you can basically just hold it in cold storage. That's what most people do. And I think it's so obvious to me. There are already these wallets you should try out like x or, or Hero Wallet, where your BTC is in a web wallet. You don't care about which layer uh, is helping do this in the background, but you'll be able to swap into stable coins. You'll be able to deploy your BTC, start earning a yield. Like basically the type of stuff you can do with ETH, you can do with BTC, right? The, the writing is on the wall, the wallets are there, the, the, the technology is coming. But I think it's going to be such a big shift where people will go like, that's the thesis that I have, that Ethereum is going to scale eventually in layer twos. It's all about the rollups. It's all about, you know, scalability is L2s, then why wouldn't this network that has $500 billion of capital, why can't it also scale in L2s, right? When the users won't be able to tell the difference anyway, right? Like it's it's about putting ETH in a wallet or putting BTC in a wallet and then, then use it. Yeah. Muneeb, uh, I think we could go for another hour here. I know we, we all have hard stops. I just looked at the calendar. The first ever episode of Empire was with you and it was March 4th of 2021. And this episode goes live March 3rd 2023 so nearly exactly two years later it's super cool to see what you've been building man it's uh really impressive and just yeah big, big congrats on everything and i think uh santi i think we have our homework uh cut out for us i think we need to do a yeah. little little play and we're let, let's, 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 let's definitely have you on uh and uh at a later time to really go deep into this if, you, if you're willing to do it maybe awesome as, I love to. as a last question were you thinking about all of this when we first recorded this episode like when you were first came on empire like was this in the works I think I think um, a bunch of this was in the works. Uh, the exact SPTC design was not. Okay. And I think the second lesson that we learned, so I think March is basically when the mainnet went live, maybe what month or two uh, have passed. The second thing that really hit the ecosystem was we optimized for decentralization so much that the slow speeds and you know the transaction volume, like there was really like people were trying to use this thing uh, and they couldn't. And I think a lot of the work in the last year has been, okay, we really need to scale this up. There is enough demand. People people want want to use these things. But you need to give them an experience like that they are already having on an Avalanche or Ethereum and so on. You can't yeah. get, give yeah. them such a bad experience where, yeah, absolutely. Uh, where it's just like, you know. Yeah, well, it's incredibly exciting. Thanks for coming on short notice. We'd love to unpack a lot of the architectural technical side of things. And uh, yeah, congrats. I mean, this has been a long time in the making, um, you know, and I think it's going to be fairly obvious given the, the amount of capital that's sitting idly there. So really, uh, th thanks so much for the insights. And yeah, hopefully we can have you on uh, relatively soon to talk about this in, in more detail. Muneeb, I think you awesome. flip, flip Santi. I just watched it happen. 30, 37 minutes is all. No, but it's, it's funny. Like, like I, I was when like we were early in DeFi and, you know, this taproot change and like this ordinal things like in crypto, I think you'll learn to appreciate this kind of like chaos theory. Like 
very small, subtle changes can have a really big impact and shift the momentum. And I'd be remiss not to like appreciate that. And I think, you know, obviously a lot of people are going to be skeptical because we've been hearing this narrative over and over. But I think this episode really just went through, I wanted to understand the developer mindset. And look, at the end of the day, you're right. As soon as people start making money and you solve the security issue of Bitcoin is the, the thing that I've been most concerned about. And the fact that it hasn't been talked about enough and people don't want to talk about it. They're like, oh, we'll punt it in the next 40 years. But the reality is like you discount back to today and you're like, holy shit, is this going to work? Fees need to come to this network. And I think usability drives value. And hopefully this is a big shift that I'm not 100% sold on yet, but it's, at least I'm appreciating the background. And Muneeb, I mean, you're, you're closest to it. So it's great. To, yeah. To no, I think, I think a deeper dive would uh, help because here's the thing, right? Like the way I think about it, that if you go deep and you're having an intelligent discussion about it, then people can see it, right? Like, and I, I do think that the false promises and in many ways, like over marketing that has happened from a lot of the maximalist cir- circles, like you need to explain that to people as well. That look, these are different communities. Like if this, it, it's not like all of us are together. We actually like fight with each other <laughs> a, a lot, right? And so actually, uh, uh, I'll wrap up on a funny note. Right? Like, um, I was on a podcast with Imran uh, from the DeFi Alliance. Mm-hmm. They had a pretty funny video discussing this, and they're like, "This guy, the amount of kind of like shit he takes, like both from the Bitcoin crowd and from the Ethereum crowd, right? It's, it's just insane." And I think it's like I, I tell my team members that you're onto something if like people hate it that much. Like you, you might be actually building something. Yeah, uh, that's pretty interesting. That's a good place to end it. We will uh we will see you again soon, my friend, and, and congrats on everything and we'll talk to you soon. Yeah, all right, very Thank you. Thank you. Bye.